is weird, odd, strange, or just plain bizarre is really your cup of tea. Then the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast will give you that fix. Can't believe it? Well, listen for yourself as we deliver the strangest news you definitely won't find on CNN or Fox. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Weird News Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Weird News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Broadcast Network. I am your host, Brittany Lawrence, and today we are going to get really weird, and fuzzy, and slimy, and prehistoric. Today is a special edition Weird News Podcast, Weird Animals. Animals are my jam. If the internet were just a never-ending stream of tiny turtles in costumes, I would probably be satisfied. Also, shout out to your boy Toby Toad on TikTok because that toad has made my entire life better on so many occasions. Anyways, back to what makes today special. It's Weird News Animal Day and it's awesome. Animals are the coolest. Animals make bad things better. Animals can also be super weird which is kind of what this whole hour is about. And we are going to talk about all the cool things they have been doing in 2020 while we've been rationing toilet paper and side-eyeing every errant cough. The coronavirus has made a lot of changes to our daily lives. It's forced us to look at things differently, including our animal companions. In most states, shelters are clearing out at alarming rates. Fostering is up anywhere from 70 to 90 percent, varying state to state. Quarantine has reminded us all how important companionship is. It's also helped to bring out the wild in places that have previously been overrun with humanity. We're going to start off today's show by exploring whether a good cuddle sesh with our four-legged buddies could end up with everyone needing a COVID test, take a virtual dive with some apparently socially starved eels, ride out with some ponies who probably have some very strong opinions on Brexit, and get creeped out by what happens when millions of 17-year cicadas make their big southern debut. At the end of the show, I will be counting down the 10 strangest animals in the world, and keeping it to 10 is extremely difficult. Sometimes, nature can be truly unhinged. One thing I heard about in the beginning of this mess that I thought was just silly was people worrying about giving COVID to their pets. Apparently, it's not a completely unfounded fear. A German shepherd in New York is now the first official dog to test positive for the novel coronavirus, after its owners noticed it was showing signs of respiratory illness. This new comes after it was previously reported that Winston the Pug, from North Carolina, was the first canine to get the Rona. But it was later confirmed by officials from the United States Department of Agriculture that they were unable to verify infection, whatever that means. Despite the confirmed German Shepherd infection and the maybe-we-thought-so-but-not-really pug report, researchers and officials say you don't need to worry too much about your household pet. We're still learning about the coronavirus and animals, but there is currently no evidence that animals play a significant role in spreading the virus, said the USDA in a statement. While additional animals may test positive as infections continue in people, it is important to note that performing this animal testing does not reduce the availability of tests for humans. That is comforting, I think. One of the owners of the German Shepherd tested positive for the virus, and the other owner showed symptoms, which suggests they transferred the virus to their dog through some sickly cuddle sessions. The dog and humans are expected to make a full recovery. There was a second dog in the house, but it did not show any coronavirus symptoms, but it did have antibodies in its system, which, according to the USDA, suggests exposure. It appears that people with COVID-19 can spread the virus to animals during close contact. According to the USDA, 
the agency further recommends to keep a safe distance from pets if infected, which honestly seems counterproductive in a lot of ways. When you're sick, your pet is basically the best medicine. That and old Price is Right reruns. Dr. Shelley Rankin, a professor of veterinary microbiology at University of Pennsylvania, also suggests avoiding contact with your pets if you have COVID-19. If you are unable to find someone else to take care of your pet, the AVMA suggests that you wear a mask with every interaction and wash your hands before and after. I mean, wearing a mask around your dog would suck, but at least you might avoid the accidental, oh, you got your tongue in my mouth, face licking for a few days. New York does seem to be a hot spot for animal coronavirus infections. The German Shepherd, a tiger, lion, and two cats are all animals in New York that are expected to have caught the virus from their owners or caretakers. CNBC reports that the actual first animal to have a positive coronavirus test was from Hong Kong. World Health Organization officials announced in April that several groups are investigating how animals get infected. The USDA also said it will work with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and with state and local animal and public health officials to make determinations about whether animals should be tested for COVID. If you thought the rush for human testing was bad, be prepared for the rush of concerned pet parents when you tell them Sir Fluffy Pants could possibly have caught the Rona. Evidently, humans aren't the only ones strived for attention during this worldwide lockdown. I've done a lot of Zoom meetings, guys. A lot. The extrovert in me is slowly deteriorating. Aquarium dwellers are apparently facing the same social dilemma. The Sumida Aquarium in Tokyo asked people to FaceTime their shy eels, which is adorable. The request was made on behalf of the organization's 300 garden eels. Keepers at the aquarium posted videos on social media showing the eels hiding in their burrows whenever people approached, and they asked the public to help. The aquarium decided to facilitate FaceTime calls to the eel tank to help the animals stay used to people. According to one statement, it seems like the spotted garden eels are getting used to non-human environments and have forgotten about people. Which is so sad. I mean... If not in an aquarium, it's not like they would know we exist anyway. But the point is, now they know. And we can't have them forgetting about us. The Sumida Aquarium in Tokyo has 10,000 marine animals from 400 species. The aquarium welcomed visitors every day, so the eels were accustomed to humans. Typically, this species of tiny eels is cautious around humans and would dive into sand when someone approached. However, keepers must be able to inspect the eels to monitor their health and breeding. Since the lockdown, they have not been able to get the eels used to human interaction, and the eels are still very shy around people. The solution? FaceTime. They set up five tablets along the eel tank so would-be patrons could see and potentially interact with the shy species. The idea was for people to be able to see the eels popping up from the sand swimming, and twice a day being fed, barring they don't get skittish and burrow. The ultimate goal was to keep them accustomed to seeing human faces and help with their care. The museum stated, We hope that our spotted garden eels will start remembering human beings. We also do hope that we can offer something good and useful for your stay-home period. This is not the first time there has been interest in these cute little guys. Seriously. If you love to love all things tiny animals, I would take a look at these eels. I'll post a photo on Twitter after the show because adorable. These tiny eels have been popular in Japan for years. Video sharing website Nico Nico Duga live streamed more than 100 hours of the eels in 2014 to nearly 800,000 viewers. Also, November 11th has been established as Spotted Garden Eel Day by the Japanese Anniversary Association. November 11th is also my son's birthday, so that's a really big day in the world. Speaking of tiny and adorable, can we take a moment to talk about ponies? Guys, ponies. Before we begin this story about Britain's wild ponies, I want to tell you a story about the time my husband had to defend my honor against a gang of wild Western Virginia Appalachia Trail ponies. 
This is absolutely a true story and needs to be told. So, my husband and I were camping in Western Virginia, specifically because the area we were camping was right on the portion of the Appalachia Trail that happened to have wild ponies. And even more amazing, it was wild pony baby season. Yeah, I married well. So, we packed our bags and went hiking. We soon found the ponies, and we would need to find another word for excited because I was on a whole other level. We decided to sit and eat some sandwiches while we were watching the ponies frolic and play. Guys, whenever anyone tells you don't feed wildlife, no matter how adorable they are, please listen. They wanted my sandwich. Of course, Fluffy Baby Face, it's all yours. But then they wanted more sandwiches. And eventually, we just ran out of food. Now, let me tell you something about wild ponies. These are not your average, run-of-the-mill, garden-variety ponies. These ponies are ripped, absolutely head to toe. They started to push me, grab at my backpack, tried to bite me, and eventually took my stuffed pony. Yes, I'm an adult that just so happened to have a stuffed pony on a hiking trip. Don't at me. That's a whole other story. My husband tried to get the stuffed pony back, but Sir Grumpelop the Fourth wasn't having it. He bit my husband. Hard. Husband proceeded to reflexively try to punch said pony. He connected. Barely. And said pony dropped the stuffed animal, huffed, glared, and walked away. All the other ponies followed. I said all that to say, please don't share food with wildlife. I learned a powerful lesson that day. Also, ponies can be really mean. Okay, now back to the Brexit ponies. On the ever-soaring slopes of Wales' Carnadale Mountains, there lies acres of unforgiving pastures. To survive on these alpine grasslands, species need to be rugged and strong. Carnadale's wild ponies are no exception and have been surviving here for thousands of years. They are just so hardy, said Sandra Roberts, who's been photographing the ponies for almost a decade. Year after year, she has seen the smallest foal survive the worst of the winter weather, following them as they mature and have young of their own. However, despite their resilience, Britain's wild pony population has dwindled to fewer than 3,000 nationwide. With Brexit, that could be about to change. According to Yahoo News, sustained by subsidies from the European Union, rural land use in the United Kingdom has for generations been guided by one principle— maximize production. But as Britain breaks away from the EU, Brussels' billions are drying up, forcing farmers to think creatively or face financial ruin. For the British Isles' indigenous plants and animals, this is good news. Driven by a need to diversify, UK landowners are embracing rewilding, allowing, even encouraging, the return of native plant and animal life to long-changed ecosystems. With this new rewilding measure in place, more than 1,000 acres are being returned to nature, unproductive land that without EU funding would soon be in the red. A handful of beavers have been set free there, with plans for other keystone species, including wild horses, to join them next year. It will not only help reinvigorate the species, it will also help farming as a whole to reintroduce native species back onto the land, which is overrun with problem grasses. Large swaths of Britain's rural terrain cannot be grazed by sheep or cattle. Mauricia Fraser, an agro-ecosystem scientist at Aberystwyth University, said, We've got some hill grasses that have taken over big areas, and the ponies actually quite like to eat them, unlike cattle and sheep. If we bring the ponies into the system, we can reduce the dominance of problem grasses, which allows for biodiversity and the ecosystem to function a bit better. The UK government, which is committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050, is eager to see such programs take off. Public money for public goods has become the mantra of Britain's post-Brexit agricultural policy. With financial incentives for farmers who encourage biodiversity, decarbonization and the conservation of native species. I love it. I do. Truly. But consider this your warning. Watch them from afar and never, ever feed a pony your peanut butter sandwich. 
Now we're going to move across the pond to learn a bit about a species not having any issues with survival, the cicada. After spending 17 years underground, millions of cicadas will be emerging in parts of the United States. The insects are expected to come out in early summer across southwest Virginia, parts of North Carolina, and in West Virginia. As many as 1.5 million of the insects can emerge per acre of land. I did the math on this, folks. That is absolutely a terrifying amount of cicadas, upwards of 45 trillion. It seems like an absolutely impossible number. Cicadas are some of the longest living insects in the entire world, though they spend almost their entire lives underground as nymphs. According to Virginia Tech University, they live in the soil and feed on tree roots for periods of either 13 or 17 years, depending on the species. The species make up 15 separate broods, with brood 9 emerging this year as part of their 17-year cycle. When the nymphs are ready, they build mud tubes, called a cicada hut, in the soil and crawl out to find a place to molt into their winged adult form and to mate. I feel like this will basically be all of us emerging from our fortresses of solitude when we can finally enjoy the presence of another human being without fear. Things are going to get pretty crazy out there. Thanks for sticking around as we talk about some of the coolest and weirdest animal stories of 2020 so far. When we come back, we'll get into exactly what Carol Baskin is doing these days, meet some Siberian quarantine babies, learn about a true spirit animal, and figure out what animal a famous Hollywood dinosaur is actually related to. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back. Before the break, we talked about whether or not our four-legged friends needed to worry about catching the coronavirus, FaceTimed with shy eels, met some ponies who definitely voted yes to Brexit, and discovered some underground bugs awakening for their impending southern infestation. We're going to continue on this weird news animal track, and if you stick around till the end of the show, I'm going to be counting down the top 10 weirdest animals. Just like their human companions, animals are not finding much else to do during this never-ending lockdown, and it would seem they haven't just been sitting around, as one Siberian zoo has seen a huge baby boom since it shut down four months ago. The Rona babies include some rare Egyptian goslings, reindeer calves, llama crias, and a baby brown weeper capuchin monkey. I'll post a photo of a couple of these llama babies on the GSMC Weird News Twitter because, y'all, it's too much. Judging by the baby boom, the lockdown has clearly been good for us because there are a lot of interesting and beautiful baby animals now, said Andre Gorbin, the director of Krasnoyarsk Sroyev Ruche Zoo. I'm not entirely sure that's how you pronounce it. I couldn't really find it, but that's the best I could do. Gorbin says the lack of visitors has encouraged mating for many of their animals, but it's caused other behavior changes as well. Many of the animals are anxious because they really don't understand what's going on. They have this sort of look of expectation in their eyes, said Gorbin. The camels seem to be the most lonely, as they apparently follow every zoo employee who walks by their enclosure. Though the new babies are a huge advantage to the lack of visitors, the zoo is suffering financially, and hopes to be able to open back up to the public soon. 
Zoos around the world are experiencing very similar baby booms since COVID touched down. Ohio's Columbus Zoo is entering July with several new residents. In June, the zoo welcomed a Maasai giraffe calf, a sea lion pup, and two red panda cubs. A baby siamang just missed the June cutoff and was born on May 29th. All five of the animals are contributing to the future of these species that are facing challenges to their survival, according to the zoo's Facebook post about the new little ones. The zoo recently reopened on June 15th after being temporarily closed due to the coronavirus. All guests are required to reserve a ticket ahead of their visit to help the zoo practice social distancing. The zoo has created a reopening plan to inform their visitors of the changes to expect on their next visit to the park. Speaking of zoos, it's been a minute since we've talked about Carol Baskin in any sense other than which tiger she may or may not have fed her husband to. Turns out, she's been quite busy during her quarantine. Carol Baskin, whose feud with Joe Exotic we all grew to love to hate in the hit Netflix docuseries Tiger King, has been awarded the zoo once owned by her nemesis. An article from CNN outlines the fallout from the Tiger King and what the future holds for Baskin's own empire. A judge ruled in favor of Baskin's Big Cat Rescue Corporation on June 1st in a lawsuit against the Greater Wynwood Development Group, LLC. The latter company once was owned by Exotic. The order gives Baskin control of the 16 acres of land in Garvin County, Oklahoma, that is home to an animal park with an array of big cats. GWDC must vacate the zoo land premises within 120 days of service of this order. Vacation of premises shall also require removal of all zoo animals from the zoo land, the court order said. According to court records, Baskin was also awarded several cabins and vehicles. Baskin, who herself owns an animal sanctuary in Florida, had for years been a vocal critic of Joe Exotic's animal park, and the feud eventually escalated into a court battle. Exotic argued that Baskin was trying to destroy his business with an online smear campaign in videos she posted to her YouTube page and social media channels, while Baskin claimed that Exotic was abusing his animals and crusaded against his use of tigers for profit. He was convicted last year in a murder-for-hire plot against Baskin and is serving a 22-year sentence for the hit attempt and other crimes that include animal abuse. Court documents allege he tried to pay a hitman $3,000 to kill Baskin, and also that he shot and killed five tigers, sold baby lemurs, and falsified paperwork to say they were donated. Baskin won a trademark infringement lawsuit in 2011 against Exotic, in which the Tiger King was ordered to pay her $1 million. In a second suit filed in 2016, she claimed he had subsequently transferred the Oklahoma property to his mother in a bid to evade creditors. On Monday, a federal judge in Oklahoma City ordered that the property be turned over to Baskin. An attorney for Jeff Lowe, the current owner of the park, told CNN the judgment was not unexpected. We anticipated Carol Baskin getting the title to the former park that once belonged to Joe Exotic, and we did not challenge her attempts to do so, Walter Mosley said Monday. All of Jeff's focus is on opening the new Tiger King Park in Thackerville, Oklahoma, which should be opening in the next 120 days. Baskin's husband, Howard Baskin, acknowledged the judgment on Big Cat Rescue's website, posting links to the court documents and writing that the documents speak for themselves. Our next story follows some unique bears in the wild, outside of the confines of any zoo or so-called sanctuary. Spirit bears are a strange and beautiful genetic anomaly, and is a rare white variant of a black bear where both parents need to carry the genetic quirk. Christina Service, a wildlife biologist for the Kita Sioux Stewardship Authority, was two years into her work with a bear research team when she saw her first spirit bear. To see the elusive spirit bear, stark white with a ginger tinge against the deep green of the temperate rainforest, was, said Service, spectacular. According to Service, the spirit bear is even more rare than they originally believed and is extremely ecologically vulnerable. A peer-reviewed study published in Ecological Solutions and Evidence by Service, a group of scientists and First Nations stewards from the Kita Sioux and Gitga, the University of Victoria, 
the Spirit Bear Research Foundation, and the Rain Coast Conservation Foundation shows that the genetic change that produces the spirit bear is up to 50% rarer than previous estimates. The studies will prove invaluable for land use planning and shows that further conservation efforts are needed. The scientific team worked closely with First Nations partners and systematically collected hair samples from 385 black bears to determine the rare gene's frequency across 18,000 square kilometers of the Great Bear Rainforest. Apparently, bears really like gross stuff because they enticed them with fish oil and beaver anal gland secretions. Ugh. Hundreds of barbed wire corrals were set up across the region to non-invasively collect hair samples when the bears rubbed up against them, snagging hair the bears would normally shed. They studied each individual hair and tested for the gene variant in each strand for the spirit bear. CSI style from each hair, we determine the individual bear's genetic fingerprint, sex, species, and for black bears, the specific carriers of the spirit bear gene, said service. The data also provided a map of the spirit bear habitats. According to service, they were able to overlay these hot spots or concentrations with parks and protected areas and see which areas are not protected from industrial activity. As it stands, only about half of the area with high concentration of spirit bears are protected by parks and other protected areas. Because the spirit bear is simply a black bear with a genetic variant, it is not classified as an endangered species, though the rarity of the spirit bear should be enough to allow for environmental protection. The gene variant discovered by UBC scientist Kermit Ritlin controls red hair in humans and light hair in other mammals, said service. As a redhead who comes from a long line of redheads, these bears should obviously be protected at all cost. We basically share a genetic code. Or something. Along the same lines of things scientists originally got wrong, let's talk about the oldest wrong theory, the Dilophosaurus. Most of us were introduced to the Dilophosaurus in the movie Jurassic Park where it's depicted as a venom-spitting beast with a rattling frill around its neck and two paddle-like crests on its head. Yeah, that's not right. Basically, at all. In fact, in anything other than name, it's strictly pure imagination. According to recent studies, a new comprehensive analysis of Dilophosaurus fossils has helped to fully realize the true breadth of its existence. Far from the small lizard-like dinosaur in the movies, the actual Dilophosaurus was the largest land animal of its time, reaching up to 20 feet in length, and it had more in common with modern-day birds than actual lizards. The analysis was published in the Journal of Paleontology on July 7th. I'm going to be honest. I knew very little about dinosaurs before becoming a mother, outside of basic dinos like T-Rex and Triceratops. But until my son, I couldn't tell the difference between the many types of Ceratopsians. Now, I find these sort of things incredibly interesting because I know eventually my son will want one to add to his collection of dinos. It's quite extensive. Right now, his favorite is a Myasaura, and believe me when I tell you we had to jump through hoops of fire to actually find one of those. He's three, and dinosaurs are life. He knows all their names and what they eat. We recently saw a Dilophosaurus at an exhibit, and he was blown away. I say that to say, this stuff is pretty cool. The Dilophosaurus lived 183 million years ago, during the early Jurassic, despite finding itself immortalized even questionably on the big screen. Scientists knew very little about the dinosaur until recently. It's pretty much the best worst-known dinosaur, said lead author Adam Marsh. Until this study, nobody knew what Dilophosaurus looked like. Seeking answers to these questions... Marsh conducted an analysis of the five most complete Dilophosaurus specimens while earning his Ph.D. from the University of Texas at Austin's Jackson School of Geosciences. The analysis is co-authored by Jackson School professor Timothy Rowe, who discovered two of the five Dilophosaurus specimens that were studied. The study adds clarity to a muddled research record that reaches back to the first Dilophosaurus fossil to be discovered, the specimen that set the standard for all following Dilophosaurus discoveries. That fossil was rebuilt with plaster, 
but the 1954 paper describing the find isn't clear about what was reconstructed, a fact that makes it difficult to determine how much of the early work was based on the actual fossil record, Marsh said. Early descriptions characterized the dinosaur as having a fragile crest and weak jaws, a description that influenced the depiction of Dilophosaurus in the Jurassic Park book and movie as a svelte dinosaur that subdued its prey with venom. But Marsh found the opposite. The jawbones show signs of serving as scaffolding for powerful muscles. He also found that some bones were modeled with air pockets, which would have helped reinforce the skeleton, including its dual crest. These air sacs are not unique to Dilophosaurus. Modern birds and the world's most massive dinosaurs also have bones filled with air. In both cases, the air sacs lighten the load, which helped big dinosaurs manage their bulky bodies and birds take to the skies. All the specimens Marsh examined came from the Cayenta Formation in Arizona and belonged to the Navajo Nation. The University of California Museum of Paleontology holds in trust three of the specimens. The Jackson School Museum of Earth History holds the two discovered by Rowe. One of the most important responsibilities of our museum is curation, said Matthew Brown, director of the Vertebrate Paleontology Collections. We are very excited to help share these iconic Navajo Nation fossils with the world through research and educational outreach, as well as preserve them for future generations. The revised Dilophosaurus record will help paleontologists better identify specimens going forward. Marsh said that the research is already being put into action. In the midst of his analysis, he discovered that a small brain case in the Jackson School's collections belonged to a Dilophosaurus. We realized that it wasn't a new type of dinosaur, but a juvenile Dilophosaurus. Which is really cool, Marsh said. It's super cool. And honestly, I haven't had a chance to share this with my son, but I'm sure he will agree. Thanks for hanging out so far. When we come back, we've got some of our weirdest animal stories still left to go including a sparrow remix that's making its way around the world. We'll learn about a symbiotic connection between fish and duck poop. Could there be more murder hornets? Spoiler alert! Yes. And to brighten the place up a bit after that, we'll talk about Elvis worms. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. In our last segment, we visited two vastly different zoos, some with adorable baby animals and some that fell from grace and now known as the former Tiger King. Discovered just how rare the white spirit bears really are and corrected history with newfound knowledge of the Dilophosaurus. Let's jump right into our next story. Apparently, some North American birds are changing their tune which is actually a lot more interesting than the original sentence makes it sound. The traditional song of the white-throated sparrow ends with a repeated triplet of notes. By 2000, however, some birds in western Canada were whistling a variation ending in a two-note pattern. That new song has since spread wildly across North America. Researchers reported online July 2nd in Current Biology. The findings counter previously held hypotheses that birdsong dialects don't change much within local regions. The rapid spread of the new song is akin to someone moving from Kentucky to Vancouver and everyone in Vancouver is suddenly picking up a Kentucky accent, says Ken Otter, 
an avian behavioral ecologist at the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George, Canada. I struggle with this, though. I have family up north and have also traveled up to New York and New Jersey multiple times for vacation. Every time I come home, I end up going a week or so where I talk way too fast and can't seem to find my R's. It takes a bit to adjust back to slow southern drawls. But the birds, they are taking it to a whole other level. They like the new song so much, it's almost completely taken over. If there was a rating system for bird melodies, it's basically triple diamond or something. The Beatles of avian performers. Otter and his colleagues documented the adoption of the Western song at a research station in eastern Canada in 2005. Only one male out of 76 surveyed sang the double-ending song. In 2014, 22% of 101 males surveyed sang the new song, and in 2017, nearly half of 92 males recorded had adopted the variation. The researchers confirmed the spread of the song with the double-noted ending across the continent, as far east as Quebec and Vermont via recordings from citizen scientists. Eastern sparrows probably picked up the new song at common wintering grounds, the researchers say. By tracking birds from central British Columbia with backpack-like geolocators, the team found that the birds migrated to the southern U.S. Great Plains, which overlap with known wintering grounds of birds that breed east of the Rockies. Scientists don't really know why exactly they are adopting the new song, but one theory is that the female birds just like it better. New song for a modern bird. I get it. Another bird that is doing some pretty strange stuff are ducks, but it's a little less sophisticated than creating a new song. A new study, and honestly, it's one of those studies where I wonder who really decided to study this in the first place, but regardless, it's about fish eggs. Usually, if a fish egg gets eaten by a duck, it should get digested while wallowing in some stomach acid, but apparently that's not always the case. A few eggs can exit unscathed in a duck's excrement, possibly helping to spread those fish, including invasive species, to different places. It's been an open question for centuries how these isolated water bodies can be populated by fish, says fish biologist Patricia Burkhardt-Holm of the University of Basel in Switzerland, who was not involved with the work. This study shows one way that water birds may disperse fish, she says. Basically, It's the ducks. Birds, feathers, feet, and feces can spread hardy plant seeds and invertebrates. But since many fish eggs are soft, researchers didn't expect that they could survive a bird's gut, says Oriolosa Vinci, an evolutionary biologist at the Center for Ecological Research in Debrecen, Hungary. In the lab, Vinci and her colleagues fed thousands of eggs from two invasive carp species to eight mallard ducks. About 0.2% of ingested eggs, 18 of 8,000, were intact after defecation, the team found. Some of the eggs contained wriggling embryos, and a few eggs hatched, the team reports on June 22nd in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Most of the viable eggs were pooped out within an hour of being eaten, while one took at least four hours to pass. Migratory ducks could travel dozens or possibly hundreds of kilometers before excreting those eggs, the scientists suggest. Though the surviving egg count is low, their numbers may add up, making bird poop a possibly important vehicle for spreading fish. A single carp can release hundreds of thousands of eggs at a time, and there are huge numbers of mallards and other water birds throughout the world that may gorge themselves on those eggs. I suppose it's kind of neat that fish eggs seem to be able to survive at least at some rate, albeit small, after being consumed by a duck, but I don't think it would be an especially comfortable way to travel. And if we're talking about things that make me uncomfortable, let's expound on something absolutely terrifying, murder hornets. Most of us have heard about the elusive bug that has apparently made its way to North America to put its hat in the ring of worst year ever. But now, it appears that two new specimens of Asian giant hornet have turned up in the Pacific Northwest, suggesting that the invasive species made it through the winter, despite efforts last year to stamp out the menace to North America's honeybees. Though extremely lethal for small animals, 
The murder hornets, as they are, are not actually a death sentence for most people. A much-quoted number from a 2007 paper puts Japan's death toll for people stung by the murder hornet at around 30 to 50 people per year. That includes people with allergies to insect venom. The less quoted parts of the report from Japan, however, point out that of the 15 people hospitalized for stings and discussed in the paper, those with fewer than 50 stings had a good chance of surviving. Unlike the coronavirus, though, even if the hornets get really established here, we won't need to stay inside. Here's the thing. A small amount of murder hornets can do a whole lot of damage, but they mostly do it to other insects. Murder hornets seem to target honeybees. Paul Van Westendorp is the principal beekeeping specialist for the province of British Columbia. He received the first Asian giant hornet specimens from beekeepers last year and knows how much damage the hornets can do. Raiding parties literally leave heaps of headless honeybees around a hive during a takeover to steal the young. With that being said, the hornets are an apex insect predator. Apex predators may be very fierce in what they can do, but there are only a few of them around, he said. So for most people, the odds of ever coming across one are low. On a beautiful hot summer day, one will normally have no hesitation to go for a nice swim in the ocean, even if we recognize that there are orcas out there, Van Westendorp says. Well, maybe some of you, but if you listen to my last podcast, you already know I'm not a big fan of the ocean. I do know there are sharks and orcas out there, so I'm not getting in. I'll probably still go outside, though, despite the murder hornets, because I only allow one pandemic at a time into my life. I simply refuse to recognize it as a viable threat at this time. Thank you. After bringing it down a bit, our last story today centers around someone that holds a really special place in my heart. My Nana was one of my best friends in the world, and there were three things she loved more than anything else. Jesus, her family, and Elvis. I mean, she really, really loved Elvis. Her collection of memorabilia was extensive. So I got pretty excited about this next story. Scientists have found new species of scaly deep sea worms. And because they are so shiny, they named them after Elvis, since they look like some of his signature outfits. According to Science News, a new look at the critters known as Elvis worms has the scale worm family all shook up. These deep sea dwellers flaunt glittery, iridescent scales reminiscent of the sequins on Elvis's iconic jumpsuits. For a while, we thought there was just one kind of Elvis worm, says Greg Roos, a marine biologist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California. But analysis of the creature's genetic makeup shows that Elvis worms comprise four species of scale worm, Roos and colleagues reported on May 12th in Zoo Keys. The four newly identified Elvis worm species are scattered across the Pacific. These deep-sea Elvis impersonators share some common traits, such as nine pairs of scales, but each species has its own distinct flair. P. Elvis's gold and pink iridescent color scheme earned it the honor of keeping the worm's namesake in its official title. P. Orphani, on the other hand, mostly sports rainbow-sparkled scales of a bluish hue. The researchers don't know why Elvis worms have evolved in such eye-catching scales. Since the animals live in the dark, deep sea, it could just be a side effect of developing thicker scales over time, which happen to refract more light, Roos says. Thicker scales could come in handy in a fight, since Elvis worms are apparently biters. My Nana also had a bit of an attitude problem, so she would probably approve. This behavior was discovered while watching a worm skirmish. Suddenly, they started doing this amazing jitterbugging, wiggling and then fighting and biting each other. On their scales, Roos says. No one's ever seen any behavior like this in scale worms. Everything about this particular creature I love. It sparkles, it's got some spunk, and loves to dance. Despite them being a species of worm, I feel like my Nana would love them too. With that being said, call your grandparents if you still have them. They love you and want to hear from you. If you've hung around with me through our Weird News Animal Edition thus far, 
We have one more segment left. When we come back, I will be counting down the top 10 weirdest animals. Some of them adorable, some actually creepy. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere where you find podcasts just type gsmc in the search bar Welcome back. In the last segment, we discovered some old birds with some new songs, touched on the weird and semi-symbiotic relationship between ducks and pooped-out fish eggs, continued to side-eye the murder hornets, and ended with some pizzazz as we learned about Elvis worms. Oddly enough, the Elvis worms didn't make it on the list of top 10 weirdest creatures, but I'll give it an honorable mention nod. Number 10, the Kinkajou. The kinkajou is the only known tree-dwelling mammal unrelated to primates, growing to about two feet in length and tipping the scales at just 10 pounds. These small mammals make their homes in forests from the Yucatan to the Amazon. Kinkajou use a prehensile tail to access and devour fruit high in the forest canopy. They are most active at night and can occasionally be spotted descending a rainforest resort patios. Native to Central America and South America, this mostly fruit-loving mammal is not an endangered species, though it is seldom seen by people because of its strict nocturnal habits. However, they are hunted for the pet trade, for their fur to make wallets and horse saddles, and for their meat. Kinkajous spend most of their life in trees to which they are particularly well adapted. Like raccoons, kinkajous' remarkable manipulatory abilities rival those of primates, The kinkajou has a short-haired, fully prehensile tail, like some New World monkeys, which it uses as a fifth hand in climbing. It does not use its tail for grasping food. It can rotate its ankles and feet 180 degrees, making it easy for the animal to run backward over tree limbs and climb down trees headfirst. Scent glands near the mouth on the throat and on the belly allow kinkajous to mark their territory and their travel routes. Kinkajous sleep in family units and groom one another. Number 9. The Echidna The Echidna inhabits some of the same territory as the Tasmanian Devil, though its range extends onto mainland Australia as well. Echidnas are one of only two mammals that lay eggs. Though they resemble a porcupine, echidnas are actually a distant relative of the platypus, believed to have evolved 20 to 50 million years ago from an aquatic ancestor. Echidnas forage on the forest floor for ants and termites, using their long snouts to capture prey. The echidna has spines like a porcupine, a beak like a bird, a pouch like a kangaroo, and lays eggs like a reptile. Also known as spiny anteaters, they're small, solitary mammals. They're usually between 12 and 17 inches long and weigh between 4 and 10 pounds. Their spines are actually modified hairs. Echidna's bodies, with the exception of their undersides, faces, and legs, are covered with two-inch-long spines. Fur between the spines provides insulation. Number 8. Tasmanian Devil The Tasmanian Devil is the largest carnivorous marsupial in the world. Though devils may resemble a small dog, these nocturnal animals carry their young in pouches and are more closely related to wallabies than canines. In recent years, Tasmanian devil populations have plummeted in the wake of a naturally occurring cancer called devil facial tumor disease. However, caretakers at the Tasmanian Devil Unzoo 
a wildlife sanctuary dedicated to rehabilitating devils and researching the disease, says that the animals are adapting to fight back. Though the Tasmanian devils look really scary, they are not dangerous. They do not attack people, although they will defend themselves if they're attacked or trapped. Devils may look fierce, but they will much rather escape than fight. However, devils have powerful jaws, and when they do bite, they can cause serious injury. 7. Pangolin Pangolins are the only known mammal with scales. Their habitat covers parts of Central and West Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. When threatened by predators, pangolins roll up into a defensive ball, protected by their armor-like coating of keratin scales. Sadly, these insectivores are one of the most illegally trafficked mammals in the world. Their scales are thought to have medicinal powers in parts of Asia, and though an international ban exists on their trade, the numbers of wild pangolin have dropped drastically as a result of poaching. These solitary, primarily nocturnal animals are easily recognized by their full armor of scales. A startled pangolin will cover its head with its front legs, exposing its scales to any potential predator. If touched or grabbed, it will roll up completely into a ball, while the sharp scales on the tail can be used to lash out. Also called scaly anteaters because of their preferred diet, pangolins are increasingly victims of illegal wildlife crime, mainly in Asia and in growing amounts in Africa, for their meat and scales. Eight species of pangolins are found on two continents. They range from vulnerable to critically endangered. 6. Naked Mole Rat Naked mole rats are a common sight in East Africa, where they burrow into the dry grasslands of Ethiopia, Somalia, and Kenya. The naked mole rat has baffled scientists for decades, thanks to a series of unusual biological traits. Naked mole rats are unusually long-lived for rodents. Some have been documented at 32 years of age. They are also resistant to cancer and are capable of living in an environment with just a tiny amount of oxygen for hours on end. They are a common sight in zoos across America. The naked mole rat, also known as the sand puppy, which is a bit of a misnomer because absolutely nothing about it is puppy-like. The naked mole rat lacks a pain sensitivity in its skin and has very low metabolic and respiratory rates. The naked mole rat is also remarkable for its longevity and its resistance to cancer and oxygen deprivation. Number 5. Axolotl This remarkable amphibian is native to a small series of lakes and canals near Mexico City. Once numbering in the thousands and providing an important food source for the Aztec, the wild population of axolotl is thought to have dwindled to just a few individuals due to habitat loss. Axolotl can grow to lengths of 18 inches, and they are characterized by a unique set of external gills, along with the ability to completely regrow lost limbs. Close relatives of the tiger salamander, axolotls can be quite large, reaching up to a foot in length, although the average size is closer to half that. They are typically black or mottled brown, but albino and white varieties are somewhat common particularly among captive specimens. Unfortunately, just like many other animals on our list, the axolotl is critically endangered. Number 4. The Jabiru Stork The glaring, dark stare of a five-foot-tall stork can be a frightening thing for the weary traveler. These mesmerizing birds can exhibit territorial tendencies, as seen in an infamous incident that occurred at the Belize Zoo. That stork's exhibit now features a roof above the visitor viewing platform after a Jabiru stork once tried to stab unsuspecting patrons with its 14-inch long bill. Jabiru storks are native to Central and South America, where they typically feed on small mammals, fish, and amphibians. The Jabiru is an extraordinary bird that is one of the largest birds in the New World. They are also the tallest flying bird in South America, standing at about an average of 5 feet and have a wingspan of 8 feet. It has a heavy black beak that is normally 12 inches long. Number 3. Coatamundi A bizarre sight in most of the United States, the Coatamundi is a common species in Central and South America that can occasionally be seen in the American Southwest. There it takes on the role of the raccoon in the food chain, 
scavenging for fruits, lizards, rodents, and eggs, as well as raiding the occasional trash can. You can find Coatamundis from Uruguay to Texas, but be warned, though they might look cute and cuddly, Coatamundis reportedly make terrible domestic pets. Coatis primarily live in forested areas, including deciduous, evergreen, rainforest, cloud forest, dry scrub forest habitats, and mountains. Due to human influence, Coatis prefer secondary forests and forest edges. They are found up to 8,000 feet in elevation. Number 2. The Harpy Eagle With a look that suggests a cross between a cockatoo and a bird of prey, the harpy eagle is one of the most distinct birds on the planet. Their wings can span over seven feet in width, carrying these 20-plus pound birds over the rainforests of Central and South America, where they hunt down large mammals like sloths and monkeys. Harpy eagles are threatened by habitat loss, but this bird can be seen at the Belize Zoo, a sanctuary for native species about an hour outside of Belize City. It is estimated that less than 50,000 individuals remain in the wild. The second largest threat to the harpy eagle population is the danger of being hunted. And number one, Sparkle Muffin. I have to say, this one really messed with my brain. There are few things I hate more than spiders. Like, I cannot. I simply cannot with spiders. So what the heck, nature, if all spiders look like the Sparkle Muffin also known as the Australian peacock spider, maybe I wouldn't be so hostile. This spider was discovered inside the woodland forests of Wondul National Park near Brisbane in 2015. Scientifically named Maratus jactatus, sparkle muffin earned its colloquial name from University of California researcher Madeline Girard, who discovered the species. These colorful spiders measure just 5 millimeters in length and display a signature mating dance, which male spiders raise a leg to signal females. They are so gorgeous and fluffy and sparkly, I almost want one. I mean, I don't, really, but almost. And that's it, guys. Thanks for hanging out today as we visited animals all over the globe and walked through some of the weirdest animal news of this absolutely weird year. And as always, thank you for listening to the GSMC Weird News Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. Be good to each other.